<clears throat> Hello and welcome to the meeting of the Amherst Conservation Commission. It is May 22nd, 2024. The time is 7.04. Um, all members present except Laura tonight. Um, we expect Dave Zomek to be attending. Um, I'll just start off with chair report. I have nothing. So skipping now to land management updates. Erin, can you handle the open space and rec plan update or did, yeah. Yeah. Go for it. Um, I've been spending quite a bit of time with the open space and recreation plan going through, um, doing some analysis to come up with some um, information to include in the update. We're meeting um, on Friday collectively sort of the the um, town hall team that's been working on the plan and we're we are planning to do some um public sessions um we're likely going to get creative and do um a session at um uh mill river one session at mill river like near the playground area and one session um at uh, groff park um area just to sort of interact with folks like rather than having a like a special meeting where we bring you know um where we invite people to come like kind of going out into the community and just talking to people um and potentially bringing some information on the survey results with us when we do it um and then i believe there's going to be a, a potentially a, like a public information zoom session and possibly a town hall session but i think some of the town hall sessions that have been in the evening have not been as well attended so you know we're still trying to figure out um what the public information sessions will look like but it's basically just continuing to gather information and um figure out our action goals that will be based on the um survey results that we completed and the public information that we've gathered thanks Aaron. Do we get to see the results in some kind of summary form? Yeah, I've requested that um, information. So um, there is like, because it was done through Engage Am Amherst, there are um, some like reports that can be published from that data. Um, I'm just waiting to receive those. So, but they're in the works. Great, thanks. <clears throat> Welcome, Dave. Good timing. Um, Aaron just gave us an update on the open space and rec plan, but you want to take over for the director's report. Go ahead. <laughs> sure. Um, thank you. Um, hope everybody's doing well. Yeah, just a couple of quick updates around town. Um, community gardens are well underway for the season. We've got, I think, a final count at Amethyst Brook is 27 gardeners at Amethyst Brook. We've expanded that a little bit based on the demand. Angela Mills in my office is doing a terrific job at kind of overseeing that and helping with rototilling and, and uh, marking out the plots and such. And I think we have about 40 plus gardeners at Fort River Farm. So um, those are our two uh, community gardens this summer and uh, lots of people very excited to get out and, and turn over the soil and, and get growing. Um, I think I mentioned the last couple of meetings, we're still waiting on word about a couple of the grants that we put in, Aaron and myself. One is for the Puffers Pond Dam and Dyke work. Uh, I think that's around 100, or excuse me, around four, $400,000 for design and permitting for uh, dike and dam improvements at, at the pond. And then uh, we also have a grant out there for um, more funding for hickory trails in particular to connect the so-called loop trail to the west with the north-south trail. So we're still waiting on that. Um, while we're at Hickory, things are going very well. Aaron has been out there consistently with myself and Bob Parent, who is a, uh, a consultant, if you will, somebody we brought in. He's an engineer. I perhaps I mentioned him before, but we were able to hire Bob with ARPA funding, We the Town, and he's um, helping us on a number of engineering related projects, including the Jones Library, the Fort River School, and also Fort River Far, excuse me, uh, Hickory Ridge uh, Trails. So he's been invaluable at uh, 
working with the uh, contractor Taylor Davis out there. So they're, the trails are coming along. They're making great progress, and uh, we've got to get them done um, by the by absolutely uh, at least the Loop Trail by the end of June. We'll talk more about kind of grand opening and when those trails will open once we're a little further along. I just met with Brad Borderweek, our land manager today, and, and summer season is kind of kicking off for him and Anthony, our assistant land manager. Uh, that means uh, keeping trails open, trailheads open, parking lots uh, uh, cared for. Um, it also means Puffer's Pond. So with the warm weather, uh, people are gravitating once again toward Puffer's Pond. Uh, they have been up there consistently on the warm days. And uh, we will begin water testing um, if likely next week uh, or around June 1st, which is the normal time we start water testing. So um, we'll keep an eye on the water quality up there. We are in the process of trying to hire summer staff, summer crew. We typically bring on, well, it used to be five to seven people, but budgets being what they are, it's likely uh, two additional summer staff. We've had some good interviews. Uh, that Brad and Anthony have conducted. And uh, I think we have some very qualified young people who want to work on the trails and work at Buffer's Pond and help us with uh, kind of a multiplier effect out there on the trails this summer. Um, as you probably know, the pancake, the Puffer's Pond Pancake Breakfast is June 1 at Mill River Recreation Area. So that is back in, in full this year. So we're hoping that they can raise a significant amount of money for Puffer's Pond. Uh, I think last year, I want to say they raised around $8,000, which is um, excellent. And then Aaron gave you the open space and recreation plan update. So it's, you know, gearing up. We're gearing up for a busy summer. And, um, and this is the time that people love to get out and use the trails and use Puffers and Mount Pollux. And, and we've also got the capital projects underway. So that's kind of a, a quick overview of some of the things that Aaron, myself, and Brad and staff are working on. Happy to take any questions. Thanks, Dave. Looks like Alex has a question. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, real quick. I got two questions, but real quick. The June 1, that's a Saturday, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the yes. 400, the 400000 for Puffer's Pond, is that just for planning or does that have some construction money in it? No, that is just for design and permitting. So I said I'd get you some language for fishways, and I haven't done that yet. Is there still time? Yeah, we don't know whether we're going to get the grant, but absolutely, Alex, please get me anything um, anything okay. you, you can and and want okay. to forward on to me. Absolutely. Okay, I started I started drafting, and I I'm a little slow on the justification, but I'll yeah, get it. Aaron can help me out on time frame, but if we got that grant, I think it would be some months of design work. So we, we might be a three to five month design period. So yeah, and we would we would keep the commission updated on that as well as the community. There's been a lot of, you know, obviously that's a high hazard dam and uh, the system up there needs to be maintained and uh, improved. So uh, we will keep you posted, but anything you can get us on fish passage would be great. Yep. Fish ladder would be great there, Alex. Thanks. Sorry. What I, will, to, I, what I will smile and say it would be wonderful. Um, it would be very expensive, but sure, let's take a look at it. The other thing to keep in mind, yeah, the other thing to just keep in mind is the, the Mill River system uh, is first compromised by the dam at uh, Lake Warner. So fish cannot make it uh, beyond uh, almost the confluence where the mill and the and the Connecticut River, that confluence there. So there's no fish yeah. over there, but we, we when, want to talk about when, both. When Hadley spent all that money rebuilding that dam, they didn't put in a fishway, which was a big disappointment. Yeah, I was somewhat part of that process early on, but yeah, we, we should really look at both of those dams in the so future, what, for sure. What I'm working on now is the justification on what fish in the system need passage in order to have uh, aquatic connectivity rather than just a blanket request. Is a, trying to put together a why do we need it paragraph. Absolutely. We would welcome that information. Yep. Thanks, Alex. Look forward to reading it too. Um, 
and I've asked around a little bit, so maybe I can hook you up with some fish people names. <laughs> All right, um, we have 15 minutes to get to some other business. Um, how about emergency certification? I'm gonna do that one, Erin. Do you wanna give us a summary? Sure. <clears throat> um, I was approached by Beth Wilson um, at the DPW. They reported that there's been some um, flooding of their access road to well number six and I'll share the photos, um, which has prevented them from being able to get to the well for their testing that they do multiple times a month. Um, <clears throat> so just in, in communicating with Beth, um, I basically suggested that we do a, a slow and controlled drawdown to try to reduce the water level here. And also um, I encouraged um, uh, DPW to try to engage, uh, you know, a group like Beaver Solutions to come in and see if they could put in uh, some type of a flow control structure or or some other uh, means of um, keeping the water moving across the road so that they can still maintain access and it will keep the water level manageable. So they're working on that. But in the interim, I did issue um, an emergency certification, which I'm hoping that you will entertain ratifying this evening. Um, and I did condition it um, to see, sorry, it's a little difficult to switch between screens here. Um, I conditioned it pretty strictly, um, slow controlled drawdown um, over a two to three day period, just opening up a one to two foot area at the top of the dam, lowering by six inches at a time over several days in a controlled manner. And then conditions associated with the approval were, um, you know, the slow drawdown to prevent flooding, scour and sedimentation, that I would have a site visit during the drawdown to observe site conditions. Um, the area is located in um, a natural heritage and endangered species area, so um, requiring that they follow any conditions that NHESP might have, and then that they consult um, a company to try to address the issue um, in some manner. So, Erin, um, um, raise my hand. Yeah. Um, well, anyway, thank you, Aaron, for um, exploring more long-term solutions than just taking out beavers and drawing down water. So I look forward to hearing more about that. Um, were you going to, you're done with pictures? Okay. Go ahead, Alex. Uh, when you had the picture up, was that a road where the dam is built along the road? Yes. It looks like a truck could still get down that road and through the puddle. Where's the well? Um. The well is on the other side of that access road. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's tight and getting dangerous um, for access. Yeah. I mean, it looks precarious and like it'll get worse. Go ahead, Andre. Yeah, um, isn't that off Warren Wright Road that you're talking about? Um, nope, it's, um, well, I don't know if you came in from the other side, but it's um, <clears throat> coming in from South, East Street. Oh, okay. Um, okay. It goes I, across. I yep. I ride yeah. my bike across there. Yeah. Okay. It's way so, in the back. It's it's like out in the um, mm -hmm. wellhead protection zone. It was flooding a bit last year too, just a bit, but that looks pretty bad. Yeah, it's gone. I was out there last year, um, and it was nowhere near like this. It's it's gotten significantly worse. Um, so. Okay. Any but more questions? But their yeah. access there if something if they really had to get to the well while this is all going on, they could still get there, right? Yeah, I think that a lot of the concern is if there was a breach of that, um if it, it if the road. It wipes out the road and also just the environmental sort of, you know, <laughs> it wipes out the road and just causes a lot of damage downstream. Yeah, so I think just get the water level under control. Yeah, my question was whether or not they were blocked from getting to the well altogether. Sounds like they're not. Now, Jason. Yeah, just out of curiosity, once the water level is is reduced, and the top, you know, whatever six inches is removed from the top of the dam or one to two feet, 
then what? What's to stop them from coming back and just rebuilding and the water level going right back up? That's a great question, Jason. Um, so the the initial discussion was trapping of the beavers and, um, you know, seeing as the trapping season ended on April 15th, I'm really encouraging DPW to, to try to manage this through the um, beaver sort of reproductive and breeding season um, until it, you know, trapping is back in season, um, just to try to be um, responsible about, you know, the management back there. I'm sure Dave has more to say. I don't want to. Go ahead, Dave. Go on. Yeah, the only thing I was going to say is that um, these situations, every one of these situations, is is absolutely unique. So I think Erin, the way she's approached it with Beth Wilson at DPW is is just a really smart way to do it. Which is, yes, short term, you know, we're gonna let some water out of the dam and take that down. But then getting in beaver solutions, they're the real experts. Um, every 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 place that beavers are building dams around Amherst, let's just stick with that, is unique and so are unique. And and um, the topography is unique, the, the stream, everything about it. And, you know, it's a complex issue. And particularly when you're talking about water supply, this is, you know, this is, Yes, it's maybe the back 40, but we've got to be able to get to that well one way or the other. So I think this is a really solid approach. I think we'll get Beaver Solutions in there and see if it can be piped. Not all places can be, um, you know, um, uh, piped and, and um, caged with the, um, with the um, lowering devices. So let's just see. Aaron will keep us all posted. I think it's it's also smart to do this right now. Um, between uh, seasons, and then let's see what DPW comes up with. But um, I've been to so many of these sites, and every one of them is different. Um, and you'll learn a lot when you go out with Beaver Solutions. This is all they do. This is their, you know, very smart of them some years ago when Massachusetts changed the trapping laws. They saw a niche, and they fill it. And most of the time, they're doing the beaver deceivers. There are situations where trapping is warranted. I think the other thing to keep in mind, and I probably have mentioned this before, but Belchertown went through this last year or the year before, where a massive dam uh, gave way in Belchertown, and uh, public roads were impacted, uh, people's property were impacted. I think it cost Belchertown close to a million dollars to rebuild a road when that dam gave out. So just, um, I think it's a good approach. Thanks, Dave. Jason? And just for clarification, when you say trapping, you mean trapping and euthanizing the beavers? Yeah, yeah. it's always a um, lethal take. Yeah, that they call it Tra trapping. Trapping sounds, sounds so yeah. euthanistic. Yes, um, right. So it'd be great to avoid just continually removing beavers for that road access point, but we'll try and see what happens before the next trapping season, uh, culling uh -huh. season. Okay, um, if there's no further questions, I'm looking for a motion to ratify the emergency certification issued to the Department of Public Works for parcel 27B-25. So moved. Second. Okay, um, was that Alex on the motion? Yeah. Andre on yeah. the second? Rachel? Aye. Andre? Aye. Alex? Aye. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay. Um, I'm just going to cover Wildflower Drive really quickly. Um, so, oh, yeah, I think we can do this in seven minutes. Um, I think that we, so a letter has been sent and we are looking to schedule an executive session, I think, to discuss this in the event that um, requested actions are not taken. So this would be for June, she's probably got it up there, 12th. Yeah, and so that would be a non-public meeting within our meeting. So we adjourn the public meeting and then we'd have an executive session to discuss this because it's um, legal. Um, and also on that, I 
don't really want to go very deep into this at this point, but if anyone has any questions, um, please raise your hand. Otherwise, I'm looking for a motion to schedule the executive session. I'll move to schedule an executive session pursuant to GL uh, chapter 3, uh, 30A, section 21A3 on June 12th, 2024. If it's needed uh, to discuss parcel 21D16 or yeah, 16 Wildflower Drive enforcement order. Second. Andre on the motion, Alex on the second. Rachel? Aye. Andre? Aye. Alex? Aye. Jason? Aye. Bruce? Bruce are muted. Aye. And I'm an aye. Okay. Um, what do you think, Erin? What can we do in five minutes? Um, I could talk about uh the the complaint we received um sure. from DEP. Um we received a complaint. It actually was um reported primarily to the town of Pelham, um, but through the town of Amherst, parcel 9C-31. It's um uh, the large woodland that's, um, I would say, north east of, um, uh, help me out with the name of the road, Dave, uh, that, that North road. East Street? That, uh, it's, it, it's off Northeast Street. Is it Rifle Range Road? Yeah, Rifle Range yep. Road. Um, north yeah, not, east. Not a real road, but called Rifle yeah. Range Road, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's kind of like a paper street. Um, and the report was, so there had previously been a forest cutting plan in this location, a really intensive forest cutting plan in Amherst and in um, uh, Pelham. And the report was that um, they were filling ditches with um, bringing in loam and filling in ditches um, on well, it, it said in Pelham, but presumably through Amherst and also the cutting plan was in Amherst as well. And the Amherst parcel was also noted in the complaint. Um, I've been working, you know, communicating with the um, um, Pelham Conservation Commission and uh, their agent did approach the owner requesting a site visit, which has not been granted um, yet to us. Um, I did consult council just to get some guidance relative to you know this complaint came in and if they don't grant us access sort of how do we deal with it um and so i, I have received some guidance internally and i'm um uh, exploring that but right now we don't really have any evidence um the next step is you know again legal action if they don't allow us on the property but there needs to be some evidence in order to take some legal action so it's a little bit of a catch-22 um and so i'm um information gathering on my end at this point thanks Aaron. um yeah i think okay go ahead andre i think alex was first so just for the record Aaron, what's the issue A complaint was filed to DEP um, anonymously that there was filling of quote unquote ditches, presumably resource area on the property that's owned by the individual um, where the report was was filed. Thank you. But, that's it. Yeah. That's yeah. It's in the packet, the narrative, if you want to check it. Go ahead, Andre. I was just thinking that maybe uh, one of the other agencies in the uh, in town might have a, a drone that uh, might be able to work with you on that. Yeah, it's funny that you say that because that was um, another uh, suggestion that was made. Um, yeah, so. not on, you know, it's not like you're going on private property. It's open to the public. The, the skies are so. Yeah. Yep, that could really come in handy. Yeah. In general. <laughs> Um, thanks, Andre. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I think we're going to move on and there's one more minute. So I'm just going to cover, since we're sort of on the same subject, the forest cutting plan review. So 
Um, we talked about this last meeting. Um, this is the Wagner Forest cutting plan. So we requested a site visit specifically from the landowner. We have not heard back. Um, and so we're taking some next steps to try and continue to get an opportunity to take a site visit. So um, we'll probably have an update next meeting on that one. Okay, and then I think we're ready to move on to our hearings. Okay, so general procedure for fairness to all applicants. Each hearing has 20 dedicated minutes on the agenda, five minutes from staff, five minutes from the applicant, five minutes for public comment or two minutes per person, five minutes for conservation commissioners. The conservation commission requires all submitted and revised materials to be submitted by Wednesday, the week prior to meeting close of business. For all presenters, please clearly state your name, your address or of the project, who you're representing, as well as if you have preferred pronouns. For all members of the public, please clearly state your name, address, and note if you have preferred pronouns. And first up is hearing one. Erin, are you looking yes. to see if we have, okay. Yep. Um, so this is notice of intent for Amherst Department of Public Works for the replacement of an existing culvert at Potwine Lane, map 23A, lot nine on the Muddy Brook. Work associated with this project is proposed in bank land under waterway, bordering vegetated wetland, bordering land subject to flooding and riverfront. All right, Erin, do you want to give us the update? Yeah, so um, since the last meeting, um, Beth Wilson, um, who's representing the Department of Public Works, uh, submitted a correspondence that addressed um, answering questions that were raised by the commission and staff at the last meeting. And also we received an updated plan that incorporates a number of um, revisions to address the comments that um, commissioners raised at the last meeting. So um, at this point, I'm I'm happy with the plans and I'm prepared to issue an order. I have um, orders of conditions drafted for your consideration tonight, but um, I will I'll stop there and let others have their comments. Thanks. Welcome, Beth. Welcome, Laura. Um, sounds like you worked with Aaron and addressed everything we discussed at great length last time. So thank you for that. Do you want to give us an update on the project? If Aaron didn't come sure. up. Yep. Yep, sure. Um, I, is that my, no, it's not my computer. Um, I can bring up, oh, do you guys hear that? Or is that just me? Yeah, everybody who's not speaking should probably mute their computers because there's some feedback. You sound better. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I can share my screen and show um, the plan set with the, the additions that we made. That's not part one. This is pot line. Um, we'll look at that one first. I think that's the first hearing on the agenda. Um, let's see, one of the comments was to add um, scour protection to the outfall of the bypass pipes. So let's look at that. Um, so here's the um, dewatering plan sheet and it's got, we added some scour protection um, right here and right here at the ends of the bypass pipe outside the coffer dam at the, on the downstream side. Um, that's gonna be temporary scour protection, basically rip wrap kind of thing that would then be removed when um, the bypass pipe is removed and the coffer dam is taken out. Um, another comment that we addressed in the plan set was we added um, you know, this, this was a comment from Alex about sheet flow coming off of the road. Um, so I guess what we wanted to talk about there was that if, you know, looking at the elevations, you can definitely see that the sheet flow is going to go from the middle of the road on the north side, um, towards these two catch basins. Um, if you look at the elevations, it's going to flow. That's definitely the low point where those two catch basins are. Um, and then those two catch basins, as we talked about before, have deep sumps in them to help treat some of the sediment. Um, and then I guess I wanted, we wanted to point out that you can see the head wall and wing walls are about here and the edge of the road is about here. 
So there is gonna be about eight to 10 feet of a vegetated buffer, both on the downstream side and the upstream side um, of the culvert that again will be a filter for sediment and contaminants that may sheet flow off of the road. And what we've added is some biodegradable matting. That's what this little kind of mesh um, shading is. We added it again to both the downstream and the upstream side. And that's to hold in place um, any exposed soil during construction and to allow vegetation then to grow through that matting. Um, I think for pot line that, that answered the questions for pot line. Um, does anybody have any other comments or questions on that? And Laura, sure, speak up if I missed anything. You got it. Great, looks great. Um, commissioners, any questions, comments? Doesn't look like it, okay. Yeah, thank you, that's very comprehensive and um, we'll look forward to seeing it. Okay, um, if there's no comments or questions, I'm looking for a motion to ratify. Nope, sorry, I'm wrong page. Just a quick comment. Go ahead. Yeah, it uh, looks like you've done a great job uh, putting these uh, putting these solutions together. I appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Andre. Mm -hmm. Okay. Looking to move to close the public hearing for pot wine lane. I'll move to close the public hearing for pot wine lane culvert replacement DEP number 089-0736 and issue order of conditions with the standard boilerplate conditions under both the um, Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act and Wetlands Protection Town of Amherst General Bylaws, Article 3.31 and regulations with the noted additional special conditions. No second. Okay. Jason on the motion. I got Rachel on the second. Rachel? Aye. Jason? Aye. Andre? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Alex? Aye. I'm an aye. Okay. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Tara. <laughs> Thank and you. This is, this is an easy transition. Okay. Um, hearing two. <laughs> Um, notice of intent for Amherst Department of Public Works for the replacement of an existing culvert at Middle Street, Map 26B, Lot 6 on a tributary of the Plum Brook. Work associated with this project is proposed in bank, land under waterway, bordering vegetated wetland and riverfront. All right, Erin, updates on this one? Yeah, so basically the same exact thing here. Um, there were uh, some several plan revisions that were incorporated into the plan set, um, which I'm sure Beth will um, give you a quick briefing of. Um, and I think that the staff and um, commissioner comments have been addressed. And so I've got an order of conditions drafted and ready for approval. Thank you, Beth. Yep, I'll share my screen again. Middle Street. Oh, sorry, flying around here. <laughs> okay, um, Middle Street. Um, we added the same scour protection, which you can see right here, um, which will be at the end of the temporary bypass pipe. And similar to pot wine, it'll get removed when the bypass pipe and the coffer dam come out. And so at Middle Street, um, we extended the, um, what is it called? The leak off. Yes, the leak off, the stone leak off. We extended the stone leak off. It, it had been just sort of at this end before at the lowest spot on the road, but we've extended it all the way to the wing wall um, on the, the south south side of the project. Um, I guess, did we do that on both sides, Laura? Yes, we yeah. did. 
yeah, it's hard to see. The shading's kind of funny here, but we did. We added an extended stone leak off on both sides, again, at the lowest point of the road where the, the sheet flow is, is going to flow off so that um, the water can filter through those rocks and the sediment can get removed. Um, and then again, there is going to be a vegetated buffer between where the head wall and wing walls are. Um, you can see on the, I guess this is the eastern downstream side, there, there'll be uh, more vegetation, um, just the way it's laid out. There'll be a bigger swale, probably about eight to 10 feet on this side, but on the, on the upstream side, more like mm, five to eight feet in there. But there will be a vegetated swale, and there'll be the leak off on this side. And then we, um, we added the biodegradable matting again and removed the, it was, used to be called sort of a turf reinforcement matting and they're a little bit different. This matting obviously is biodegradable, um, but again, the idea is to hold the loose, the loose soil, exposed soil during construction. And um, that turf matting had just been on this one end, the south, southeast, part of the project, we added it all the way around on both sides with sort of this this funny little shading. Um, so it, it, it encompasses on both sides of the culvert, both on the upstream side and the downstream side. We added a whole lot of that matting, um, again, to allow the vegetation to grow. Um, and then the other thing we did on Middle Street, more in response to um, Aaron's comment on, uh, I guess it is right there, Aaron's comment about the eddying of the water when it, when it comes out of the downstream end, how it's going to kind of come out of the new culvert and turn because the whole stream really turns to the north. Um, we changed the design in that, so right, right now existing, there's a bunch of riprap on this embankment going up to the road because of that very thing. Um, and the original design was to take out that riprap um, and just vegetate the bank, but we've we've decided to put the riprap back in. <laughs> and and I and we I don't know if we talked about this last time, but even just having a wing wall right here, which doesn't exist right now, will help with that. So the you know the water will come out, it'll circle around, and if it does come back, we we'll still have a wing wall protecting the embankment, and then we're also going to um, enforce it with more riprap like it is right now. Um, I think that's it. Anything else, Laura? That's it on this one. Okay. Also, just to add to Beth's presentation, um, we did get a letter from Natural Heritage um, that basically reported that there was, they, they issued a determination letter saying that they didn't feel there would be a take of it, um, endangered species and endangered or threatened species with the project. Thanks, Erin. Um, commissioners, any comments, questions? Okay, I'm seeing none. Um, again, thank you, Beth. Thank you, Laura, for uh, addressing all those comments. Um, okay, commissioners looking for a motion. I will move to close the public hearing for Middle Street Culvert Replacement DEP number 089-0737 and issue order of conditions with the standard boilerplate conditions under both the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act and Wetlands Protection Town of Amherst General Bylaws, Article 3.31 and regulations with a noted additional special conditions. Aye. Uh, second. second. Jason on the motion, Andre on the second. Andre? Aye. Jason? Aye. Alex? Aye. Thank you Bruce. both. Aye. Rachel? Aye. Mem and I. All right. Thank you guys. Have a good night. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, well, that does it for our hearings, but um, we're on to the big business slide now. Um, I, I'd like to just get 30 Kestrel out of the way. I'm not sure how many commissioners got to read that very minor change in just the sort of the plant list and placement. So I was able to go out to the site 
And I looked at, I just made some suggestions for their blueberry replanting. Um, so instead of in that garden plot, they're going to be sort of edging uh, with the wetland. So more of a natural shrub contiguousness with the wetland buffer area. And then I looked at where the Eliagnus, the autumn olive was, and I just based on the site conditions and what was already growing there, I just had some suggestions for some different genera. But I think that we can leave it open for the winterberry and the plants that I mentioned. And um, I don't know, they could go get, a, depending on what's available and depending on what looks good, I think anything would be fine there. So um, those are my recommendations. I just wanted to ex expand the allowable plant list because I think it was specifically all winterberry. And I think there could be some flexibility there. Alex, go ahead. Didn't you recuse yourself from that project? I accuse myself from the vote. Yeah. Maybe, I, I don't know, am I not allowed to speak here? <laughs> Aaron, can you? Yeah. Um, I mean, just to like sort of, because I think it's, it's, it's there. Michelle is, is acquainted with the people who own the property. So was there socially and was looking at it and offered sort of suggestions. And then the owner reached out to me saying, I'd like to have some flexibility on some potential different planting options based on these recommendations that were offered. So um, that's sort of how it all came to, to me was through the owner. And I think Michelle was just giving background relative to her understanding of the property, having visited it. Um, but that is yes. the sort of backstory. Go ahead, Bruce. I agree with the ideas. Thanks, Bruce. Well, anyway, wow. I was there. I saw it. Um, you know, I know my plants a bit. And so that's my input. So take it or leave it, commissioners. But it is minor. And I think it... Um, is worth considering. I support diversity of vegetation. Yeah, and I mean, I don't think that there's even really a vote necessary to approve this. Um, I think it's it's such a sort of negligible um, detail of the plan. I think it's more so just to keep you guys in the loop that the landowner was thinking of diversifying the plant list a little with some other native species to make sure if we do a follow-up where there is say a certificate of compliance issued that you guys aren't shocked when you see additional or different natives planted out there that there they were, it was suggested to them that some others could be mixed in there um, to diversify a little bit. Okay. Yeah, there is some concern that that was sort of codified in the in the permit because it was very specifically mentioned. So that's sort of what this is trying to do is leave some um, opportunity for diversification. Go ahead, Andre. Just to say that I won't have a problem with that change. Okay. All right, if no vote is needed, no one else has any questions. Um, I think we can move on to Fort River School, DEP number 089-0729. <clears throat> Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead, Aaron. So I'm going to do my best to present this. And the reason for that is because there, um, so let me just give you sort of a snapshot. Um, I, I received a request to amend the order of conditions for Fort River School. Um, there are a number of changes and there's details on the changes. I think that there's, um, a couple sort of questions for the commission to consider tonight. One is whether to consider this a minor administrative change to the order of conditions or whether you would like the applicant to come back with a formal um, amendment to the order of conditions. Um, so just for the sake of sort of um, laying the groundwork for the request, there's no increase in impervious surface associated with the work. Um, Everything is within the existing work footprint. Um, these are all modifications to stormwater systems or underground piping, which um, uh, still are consistent with the stormwater management standards. They are they were adjusted for a variety of reasons, which I'll I'll outline to you. Um, and uh, there was uh, the 
um, surfacing for the um, playground was determined. The reason I'd like to present this is to just present it to you sort of in a broad context, um, because I feel like I have sort of a layperson understanding of how to explain the changes. But the engineer from Horsley Witten is on the call. Um, if you have, if you want to dig into more technical um, questions on the on the project, and or if you feel that this the changes are substantial enough that it warrants a formal amendment, that's completely fine. It's mostly to just present what the changes um, to the plan are. What are the changes? Uh, hold on, Bruce, do you have a question about procedure? Well, I just wanted to figure out the balance here. So there is a memo from Horsley Witten that basically states in like a page and a half what the changes are and they, in, in one or two sentences each, they seem reasonable. So on that side, I was like, okay, this, this makes sense to me. But then there's like 300 pages of a gigantic report on yes. water and several other aspects. And I didn't have time to read all that, nor would I necessarily understand it. I'm be counting on Jason to fully understand it. Um, but that, that balancing, I don't quite know what the, which side to, Go on with that. Right. So, so Aaron did sit down with an engineer for like two hours to review these plans in great detail. So I think that we should let her give us her summation, her layman summary of these. And then if anybody has any specific questions, we can invite um, some more technical expertise to answer them. Does that sound good? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So, and, and just to sort of comment on one thing that Bruce said, which is that there is a stormwater report um, calculations. These are all basically substantiating the um, hydrologic calculations for the changes to the stormwater report. So um, that's those are sort of the backup documentation that support the request. So just want to clarify that. And commissioners aren't expected to, you know, necessarily know all of the details of that, but um, I'll just, I'm just going to go over the big picture items. And then again, if we want to get into more detail with Steve, um, we can. So the first is that the, um, the playground uh, material was, um, uh, is proposed to be the corkeen material, which uh, is the cork based um, product, which I guess was determined to be the most sort of safe and environmentally friendly option. Um, and so that is, the commission may recall that we didn't actually approve surfacing for the playground because there were outstanding concerns about the environmental um, impacts of the material that was proposed originally. So <clears throat> that corkeen material is proposed for the playground. Um, there, <clears throat> there were two um, sand filters which were um, proposed as part of the stormwater management and I'm kind of pointing to them right here. Those sand filters, um, for a variety of reasons, mainly due to the steepness of slopes within the um, the filter itself, and also the fact that um, when in the course of a storm, those sand filters would fill with water, and um, we're talking on the on the um, ballpark of like three to four feet, they would fill with water with steep slopes inside. And there was some concern that they would be holding water and present a safety hazard to children on the site if kids decided they wanted to go in there and play or, you know, uh, fell in or something like that, um, that there was potential for safety problem. So um, these uh, there have been some adjustments to those um, in terms of their depth and in terms of their um, uh, volume capacity and also um, some like structural changes to the the one in the front where there um, a portion of it is being replaced with a sediment four bay rather than a um, just a sand filter. And then um, because of those changes, because of the changes in volume that are triggered by those changes to those swales, there is a um, an underground infiltration chamber um, that is now located under one of the parking lots to compensate for that additional volume. The other um, large change is that the staff parking area 
which was originally proposed to be part of the phase two of the um, project. Um, they've recognized that they actually need to do that as part of phase one because they don't have enough parking to accommodate um, all of the parking needs of the school um, when that phase one is completed. So they've added a, a phase one C, which includes that staff parking area. Now, these changes that were made have triggered other changes, which are piping connections. Um, uh, there were some additional structures which were also added in order to accommodate some of these changes. So I am glazing over the changes a bit. These are the, the highlights, the major changes. There are additional catch basins which have been added to the site. There were some adjustments to, again, the piping connections, mostly based on the changes to the structures that are proposed. So that's sort of just like a brief overview of the changes that were made, again, within the existing building footprint, within the existing work area, not expanding impervious surface, not substantively changing the stormwater calculations um, for the site. The only major change that this triggers from my perspective is um, from a monitoring permit um, from a monitoring of the construction rather, which is that um, when I'm doing the, the pre-construction meetings and the erosion control inspections, that it's gonna slightly change the areas that I'm um, inspecting and when I'm inspecting them. So those are sort of the major changes that it triggers to the permit. The other piece of it that it triggers are changes to the operation and maintenance plan, which is the reason why there's an updated operation and maintenance um, plan that's associated with the stormwater report. And one thing I did talk to Steve about was making sure that the Department of Public Works and also the school department and the town administrator were on board with these changes. Um, so basically sort of a checks and balance to make sure that they're still okay with these proposed stormwater structures to ensure that they're going to be able to maintain them in perpetuity. Um, so those were sort of my, um, how I wanted to just lay the framework for this so that the commission understood what the changes are. Um, I'll pull Steve in and commissioners feel free to ask questions um, or, you know, however you want to handle it. Karen, your request um, to the town for the approval of the updated OMP, is that pending? Is that is determined? Um, so I spoke with Steve yesterday afternoon and basically said, you know, have DPW has DPW looked at this? Is the school department okay with these changes? Is the town administrator okay with these changes? Because ultimately, previously they're the ones who signed off on it and said we'll be responsible for the maintenance. So um, I don't know how far along in the discussion he's gotten since yesterday afternoon, but there may be some additional sort of um, I's to dot and T's to cross relative to that. Okay, thanks. Hi, Steve. Welcome. Um, okay, Rachel, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Uh, two more administrative questions. Um, one, I see that there are turtle barrier protections as part of this plan. Um, has Natural Heritage been notified of these changes, and do they have any comments? Um, I understand that they are being notified, um, and I believe that they're just pending comment. Okay. And the second question is, um, with the orders of conditions, was there a plan recorded on file with yes. this submission? Um, so that would be tied to the deed and the property. So if in future future work or for your review or analysis, um, it might be helpful to have another, an up, the updated plan or the updated O&M diagram um, record, deed recorded, if that is indeed what is built, that that might be something to think about so that there's a crumb trail for the future, future maintenance and tracking. Mm -hmm. Good point, Rachel, thank you. Um, so I think the first thing that we need to decide is whether or not we're going to move forward with this as a um, minor administrative change. So I just want to maybe take a show of hands, Alex, if you don't mind turning on your camera. Um, so raise your hand if you are willing to move forward with this as a minor administrative change, as opposed to a new NOI, which requires the filing and the abutter notification, et cetera. Can I, can I interrupt? 
for a second? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, just the last question about the recording of the plan. I think that would change how I would vote on this. Um, if there is a mechanism to get that material loaded and on record, yeah. that doesn't, um, that doesn't, you know, whatever format it needs to follow to get that information, I would support that. So I don't know if, if that's minor or a more formal change. Right. Aaron, do you have any? Yeah. Space? So I can look into that a little bit more um, and, and, try to get an answer to, to Rachel's question relative to how to make sure that the um, updated O&M plan is, is referenced in the final documents and if there's a mechanism for us to somehow record that um, so that it's uh, documented that the change was made. The other thing is I wouldn't necessarily expect the commission to vote on approval of this this evening um, because we're still pending, you know, getting some information from Natural Heritage, still pending getting some information from the school department, town administrator, DPW, et cetera. Um, but mostly for them to know sort of what direction they're going and also if there's any outstanding questions that you have on the project that they can address um, now. Okay. Thanks. So we'll add that to the list of pending questions. And then I think we just open it up for questions from commissioners. Go ahead, Andre. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have a problem with uh, continuing as a, uh, as a minor administrative change, um, but I, but uh, I'm not ready to uh, take a full vote up or down on it yet. Okay, thanks, we'll Andre. Put it out uh, for the uh, for our discussions. Um, okay, so any comments, questions on the changes themselves? Go ahead, Bruce. Like I said before, the as they were described in the summary memo, they seemed reasonable. Um, I just want to make sure that if there are deeper technical questions, issues that they get addressed, and maybe DPW is one of the ones that will have to do that, but. So I'm not ready to vote on it either, but for that reason. Thanks, Bruce. Jason? Yeah, as a point of clarification, the underground, the subsurface detention system, it says here that it's a lined detention system. Um, Aaron, I thought you said infiltration system. So I just want to make sure that it, is it detention or is it infiltration? Because if, if I think you're muted. Uh, sorry, I think I might have misspoken. I think it okay. is in fact a detention system, and I think that the intention is for it to to detain water and allow it to um, slowly sort of percolate through the system um, and and provide more additional storage um, for storm events. But um, I don't want to. <laughs> uh, certainly, Steve can address that as well. That, that is correct. This site generally has um, high groundwater. So we are looking at a lined detention system uh, in this area. And the reason it is a detention system is the sheer volume of water. We want to make sure that we are managing the release rate so we're not adversely affecting uh, downstream areas during those larger storm events. Okay. And then the original the northern or the southern the southern uh sand filter it says here is revised to sediment four bay is that so the entire sand filter is now just a sediment four bay that is correct it is a sediment four bay and then there is a deep sump uh catch basin in the center of it that then routes to this detention system uh, the reasoning behind that is <clears throat> that sand filter area is also and the larger set of plans is covered by a uh, set of solar panels so it'd be difficult for uh, plant life to grow in that area as well as um, there was the grading issue um, and trying to capture that um, large volume of water from the adjacent parking lot and the drive through that comes up the right hand side of all the parking lots um, that's flowing toward it. So okay. I didn't see a detail for the sediment four bay. Um, is that rock? Is that riprap? Uh, it, it is uh, going to be riprap of, of a, a river stone size. Okay. So as far as O&M is concerned, then if we do get 
weeds and other things growing in there, are they going to be spraying herbicides in there? Are they going to be picking those weeds out by hand? Because uh, if you're collecting sediment in between a bunch of rock, inevitably you're going to get weeds growing in there. Um, so how are they going to maintain that? Or are they just going to... And then how would they clean the sediment out? Is there a prescribed um, maintenance timetable? Uh, I believe there is a... Uh, section within the revised O&M plant that uh, describes that it um, being in close proximity, I don't believe it would be sprayed. Uh, it would be hand-picked. And um, <clears throat> the sediment as it accumulates would um, generally be uh, 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 scooped out as necessary and uh, to the best of its ability, um, whether it be by um, uh, manual means or uh, mechanical means. And did the district agree to that? So or are we still waiting on that agreement? We are waiting on the uh, discussion with uh, the district and Public Works to update that agreement. All right. And so just as we move forward then, um, I don't know, Aaron, this potentially might be a question. Can we write that in that there is no uh, no use of any kind of herbicide or pesticides to handle weeds or anything like that in not just this four bay, but any of the, the other four bay as well. Yeah. So right now the order of conditions already has a condition for that. Um, the only thing that herbicide is approved for in the order of conditions is the um, prescribed um, treatment of invasive species, which there for which there was a um, invasive species management plan um, specifically for removal of um, Japanese knotweed, I believe. So I believe that the order of conditions would already cover that, but we could certainly, if the commission did decide to do this as a minor administrative change, um, then we could certainly include that as a condition. And I'd be happy to um, put together sort of a, a letter to prepare as we move to that, um, if that's the direction that the commission goes. Okay. Thank you. I support, yeah, I support that being explicit about it and as, you know, redundancy is not necessarily a bad thing all the time. Um, okay. Andre, did you have your hand up? No. Any other questions, commissioners? Okay. Um, so I guess we are going to see you next time, Steve, and hopefully we'll have some of these pending questions answered by then. Um, is, is that it, Erin? Do we need to? Yeah, I mean, it just sounds like points? Okay. generally no one has really spoken up about objecting to consideration of this as a minor administrative change. Well, Rachel had reservations based on, yeah. Right. If, as long as we put some precautionary measures in place to make sure that, um, it's clear in the O&M plan and, um, you know, and I have equal concerns about that as well. So I want to clarify that behind the scenes as well. Thanks, Aaron. Alex? I'm with Rachel on making sure that the material we're talking about, the changes as part of the record, knowing that uh, minor administrative change is a term of art, and it doesn't necessarily mean that the change is minor. Thanks, Alex. Okay, um, I think we're good then. All right, thanks for joining, Steve. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Okay, um, let's see, where are we? UMass. Um, so I believe Jason is here for UMass. I will bring him in. Um, while Jason is coming in, I can give you just a brief update on where things stand with UMass. Um, so Dave and I met uh, last Friday with Jason and um, another gentleman from UMass, and I'm blanking on his name at the moment, but um, a member of the facilities management team and discussed sort of the issues and solutions moving forward um, to try to sort of improve communications between UMass and the Conservation Commission. And so um, 
Jason uh, has come this evening to basically discuss some of the solutions that we um, have come to in terms of um, ways that we can bridge the gap and improve our communication and um, some some measures that the university is taking to um, sort of address the concerns that staff have raised. Very good Greet greetings all. I am uh, Jason Venditti. I am a project executive in the design and construction management group here at UMass. Um, every time uh, off camera when they would say, Jason, your opinion on that, I kind of perk my ears up. So if Jason Skeels gets in the room, there'll be three Jasons. And I have a David Dower above us as an executive director of campus development. So there could be two Davids and two Jasons or three Jasons. So I uh, have been in front of the Amherst uh, Conservation countless times. It has been a while that I have been in here and uh, it's good to be back. And it's actually good to be meeting you all for the first time. So good evening. Um, again, I'm not actually the project manager for the pavilion project, uh, but I am here to help provide uh, assistance to that project and moving forward and you know more globally, how we can work together. And as Aaron said, and with David's uh, nod, work together in regard to how we manage our communications with the conservation commission itself and both with aaron and jo aaron and david but also with the commission so uh i do uh, compliment the fact that aaron and david were able to meet with us and we had a very productive meeting and at that conversation we discussed the process for this project and for globally uh, going forward as aaron acknowledged so we do indeed acknowledge that there was a failure in process in regard to how we were intending to leverage our comprehensive O&M notice of intent. And, you know, we, we feel that that was a breakdown in process. Uh, luckily, or good for UMass, that we are um, aggressive with our project SWIPs and management of SWIPs. And we challenge our construction teams that are actually performing the work to make sure that there's uh, stormwater pollution prevention plans are indeed intact and constantly inspected. So this was a failure in process for this so there was uh no erosion control measures in the buffer that were there and we could get into more details as we move forward but with all that preamble being said uh we basically concur that we will be complying with the request um, to come in and submit a retroactive notice of intent for this project we have engaged swca and to assist us and uh, they are working towards that. They're still in information gathering and doing documentations. And as you guys know, notice of intents take a little bit to put together. And then we would go through the formal process of abutters and notifications and advertisements, et cetera. And I would say that means we're probably a few commission meetings away. Um, don't have a timeline exactly on that. So we'll keep Aaron and David up to do date on that. But um, and then we could talk, you know, process wise globally how the campus is strategizing to make sure that these failure processes, process failures don't continue to occur and how we can work together proactively. And does that mean it's in addition to um, we meet with the DPW team quarterly and we find that those meetings are very productive? And do we do something similar to that as a extremely early in the process? Hey, we have an idea for a project in the center of campus. It's a renovation to this building. And you know, we don't believe there's any resources, but we wanted to let you know this is coming in the next few years kind of a thing. So that way it's, uh, there's, you know, we can discuss at a very early timeline if there are any possible, you know, nearby or adjacent resources or et cetera that might be impacted by any projects. And we concur that that actually be a very productive, uh, you know, team atmosphere to be approaching some of the, you know, the products that we have. So it wouldn't be just a standard, hey, as an NOI for another project, what's UMass doing over there? We'd be much more inclusively including, you know, David and Aaron with that process of here's where we're headed. And, you know, then we would further strategize in regard to how we, you know, formalize and basically more develop the exact protocols for what the comprehensive notice of intent um, is, uh, is there for, what it, it should be and can be performed with leveraging that process. And what is outside of that and what the process is, again, for early communication and the NOI process and et cetera. So we, I have nothing to present tonight, but I, we didn't want to let a meeting go by without having at least putting a face from UMass uh, in front of you. Um, we, are, we are stewards for resources. We are stewards for the environment. And, you know, although we've fallen down on certain prophecies, it's, I hope that people, I think Aaron and David know that we are stewards for what we preach and what we teach, you know, and it's not just a, 
you know, big bad UMass over there on the hill, it's we really do care about resources and the environment. So I welcome any comments or questions. Thank you, Jason. Appreciate that. Um, and thank you for meeting Dave, Aaron, and Jason. It sounds like you did a lot of discussion behind the scenes to find a path forward. And just to reiterate, our concern was that we were seeing a lot of these projects come as emergency certifications instead of um, formally as NOIs um, as required by the, the OMP. So we would like to, you know, put a stop to that pattern, which mm -hmm. we sort of recognize happening. And it sounds like you've got a plan in place and I'll leave it to you guys how often that meeting happens. Um, Dave, I see your hand up, um, but essentially we just want to make sure we're following those guidelines that those projects need CONCOM review and approval and that we're all following the state laws. Um, go ahead, Dave. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. I just wanted to echo what, what Jason and Aaron said. We had a very productive meeting. I see some other staff. Um, David Dower uh, was with us. Um, I, I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. He's mm -hmm. another staff member at, at the university who is relatively new, and we just met him last week. And, you know, I think there's a real sincere effort by UMass. You know, I know the commission has been talking about projects, uh, you know, for, you know, well over a year um, from culverts to uh, parking lots to, to the more recent uh, project on Orchard Hill. But as, as uh, Jason indicated, we had a very productive meeting um, I think the more communication, the more consistent communication we can have, the better UMass has and, and will continue to be a partner. Uh, Jason also talked about some very interesting ideas, um, you know, relative to the um, to the campus pond and Tan Brook. And I know from my many years of working with the university, they they want to be a good partner. They're good stewards of their land and the resources they they have. And and so I think, as Jason said, uh, there's been there's been a few hiccups, but I think we we're we're back on a very good footing here. So I look forward to working with Jason and David and other staff at UMass, and of course Aaron around that table. So I think this is a a, a restart here of of a very good place to be. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Dave. Go ahead, Rachel. Yeah. Um, th thank you, and, and and thanks, Dave and Aaron and Jason for meeting and kind of talking through through like the big picture and how to keep it from happening again. Really appreciate that. Um, just a thought, I wonder, I, I know sometimes projects may be coming from your your institution or maybe you may be hiring consultants to prepare bid mm -hmm. documents. And I don't know how much you have input on front end documents, like the spec technical specifications that are submitted with the drawings for, for a bidder to bid on. But I wonder if it'd be a, a simple, another, another fail safe may just be having some blanket front end statement and of requirements for the for any bidder that um, that they would be required to get approval from the conservation commission or something some language to that effect that again would let a contractor know that if they're going to do any work on UMass campus they have to make sure that they have all the conservation permits in in line at, or a letter or some notification or an email from the conservation commission that they're not in the jurisdiction. So that might yes. be that might be a, a, a real in addition to the great work you guys are going to do um, to building a stronger bridge, having something like that on a technical fail safe um, yep. that they would be legally obligated to within their build the bidding structure could be helpful. Yeah, we have we actually we just we did strategize on a few different opportunities of where we could create these um, you know check dams call them that would allow us to have, you know, as in the concept stage of saying, we want to, I have no idea what, we want to build, you know, an entire bridge over the stadium because we want to build a bridge over the stadium. We, we would not allow that. We would discuss that at a very early stage before we hired any consultants at a very high level with us first and kind of begin that process of looking at resources and what we have mapped. And some of that would be death god at stuff. Some of it would be like, man, actually, this is a good idea. Maybe we should go out and flag resources and start to do that. Maybe we do ANRAD for larger projects going forward. So it's there's that. And then there's uh, fail safe systems internally that we have some kind of better GIS as remapping system that allows us to have you know all projects tracked, actually not even just projects. If we want to put a road sign somewhere and the dig safe goes in and it shows up in buffer, at the very least, that's one more way to catch things before work is commencing prior to actually you know, doing proper, you know, not only just notification, but evaluation and establishment and mapping of resources. So 
there's a lot of opportunity there that we obviously as a group we're working with you know and that's actually not just uh, Aaron and David. I think it's going to be DPW and sharing resources with them in regard to how our mapping is overlap. We share aerials. We share uh, the, the way we get uh, photogrammetry and such. So is there a way that we could start, you know, leveraging technology, leveraging relationships and how many fail safe processes can we put in place to catch as many ways to not let things happen without proper notification, proper assessment and et cetera. So we're open to that. We're in the very early stages of trying to implement different strategies. So we're, we, at this stage, no idea is a bad one. So, sure. Thanks, Rachel, Jason. I like that idea. Rachel, Bruce, go ahead. Well, I'm very encouraged by all these ideas. And I'd like to ask that the staff, the two staffs actually implement them by putting things on a schedule to say, oh, if we're going to have these quarterly meetings, Here's when they're actually already scheduled going out forward. And in particular, because I am I have a particular interest and concern about the um, pond dewatering and dredging project. And so I think these ideas need to be implemented as rapidly as possible because we should be talking about that one starting the next meeting. Um, it's, it's a huge thing and I'm pretty concerned about it. So... Yep. I would ask you to implement this stuff sooner than later. Yep. Well, I want to step on David's toes, but I did. I, I'm so uh, energized by some of the ideas that we have for the Tanbrook to the how we manage uh, how the head wall functions, um, how it correlates to the overflow and goes down to Boyden Fields, you know, and water quality in the pond and as campus as is the campus itself as big as it is, the 1200 acres as water exits the campus, the water quality that exits the campus. So. We, I gave a, I don't want to call it a presentation. It was technically supposed to be a discussion, but it ended up being, you know, Adobe slide that I ran through with David just to kind of give him a very high level. Here's things we're thinking. And it was the reason why I keep saying conversation is it wasn't a, here's what we're building. It was, no, we want to engage you in this process. And the consultant that we hired to help us put together some of the engineering aspects of that, we purposely did not exclude um, the town portion of Tanbrook because we wanted to actually go through metrics of, you know, not just what our stream flow was when it enters our campus, but water quality and all that kind of stuff is related to you, the town too. The town cares about Tanbrook as much as we do. So uh, we, it's it's somewhat technical in regard to the nature where we're at right now with lots of ideas on the tables. And that's why it was a conversation, not a presentation of here's what we're proposing to build. But some of the things we're doing actually will definitely benefit the town. Like we challenged them to come back with, you know, climatological analysis to say, you know, we talk, you know, you guys have heard it often, two, 10, 25, 50 year, 100 year storms and what those mean and flow rates, et cetera. And what we wanted to do is get that, that be to be hyper local. So we allowed them to engage in our climatology center here to actually go through and actually come back with a design storm that's much more empirical on campus, which is corollary to what would be an empirical storm for the town. So. You know, though that kind of information sharing is what I where we want to head, and that's why when I reached out, this, what's interesting about this is that that was uh five six weeks ago or so that we I actually did that, and so I I think that uh I'm hoping that you know David maybe to raise your hand and say yeah Jason is a good guy I'm choking, but it's um I I we have great ideas and we have you know we want we agree with you know the concept that the pond is very sensitive and Tanbrook itself as a resource is a wonderful resource for us all and we want to protect it and so and again the we it's not a presentation level yet for this commission but we have engaged with David and others to start getting that conversation going so thank you thanks Jason okay well that's exciting projects on the horizon and yeah mm. look forward to implementation of this and um see what comes out of it so I guess staff will leave it to you guys to nail down your quarterly date but it sounds like that's where we're going and maybe we just get updates at our meetings on on your meetings with UMass any other questions commissioners okay Jason, thank you for taking the time tonight to come talk Not to us. No problem at all. Enjoy it. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Okay. Um, 11 trillion. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, I was contacted by the owners of 11 trillion. They were able to have the um, 
uh, survey markers put in place for the 100 foot buffer. They also sent along a video which indicates relative to the the lawn area and sort of the um, wooded slope where the extent of the 100 foot buffer is located with the pins. So um, I uploaded those into the OneDrive folder so you could see relative to sort of that boundary line where the markers were placed. Um, they invited me to come out for a site visit. I wasn't able to get out there before the meeting tonight, um, but I think they're getting, they're feeling like they want to sort of resolve um, the the situation, feeling like they've, you know, they've complied with what the commission asked for. And so I think where we're at at this point is what other um, uh, requirements would the commission ask for in order to feel that this um, matter is sort of reaching resolution or at least a compliance level at this point? Um, a couple things that Michelle and I discussed offline were potential placement of like permanent boundary markers at that 100 foot um, buffer line, which we uh, have required for many other projects to um, give the landowner a visual um, indicator of sort of where their activities should stop and what areas must remain in a natural condition. I know the commission had previously discussed um, additional um, mitigation in the form of, you know, planting or restoration. Um, so I guess just trying to get a read from the commission in terms of if is the com where is the commission at um, in terms of what they would like from this point forward. Thanks, Erin. And I'm not sure who got to look at the video, but um... There is some minor encroachment um, from the de some development um, into the hundred foot, so it's not a perfect boundary line. Go ahead, Jason. So that those videos, the hundred foot buffer, right? There's there's encroachment in the hundred foot buffer, but it goes all the way down. You know, it goes all the way down to the resource. Um, one of the things that we specifically said was the use of biodegradable erosion control matting. And we know that they put in non-biodegradable erosion control matting. They have silt fence in there. So for me personally, I think I, they put in biodegradable on the backside. Is that in the hundred foot? The, so the non-biodegradable was outside of jurisdiction, just in case that alters. Yes. Uh, the first time. So did they remove what they had originally put there? Because they originally put non-biodegradable matting in the back. They yeah, said they couldn't right. get biodegradable matting. Um, so yeah, the, the the netting or the the um, jute netting in the back, I did confirm is the biodegradable uh, material. It doesn't have any of the plastic netting in it whatsoever. It's just a jute mesh um, with straw and seed. The material in the front, which is on the the road side of the slope, which comes down to the road near the catch basin, that was a plastic material uh, or like a plastic netting material. And I did talk to the owner about that. They sort of, they were like, you know, we've spent thousands of dollars. It's stable. We've put, you know, wood chips over it at this point. And they were kind of hesitant to, it was one of those things, you know, they were, sort of unsure about and I I didn't push it because they've complied for the most part so I guess this is why I'm looking for a read from the board of what additional you know I don't I want to I want to be reasonable but also um you know yeah fair I, to the commission I don't I don't I'd like to be reasonable as well but I think that this was a particularly egregious I think they just went in there and kind of blow and go and do whatever they want to do. And so when it comes to um, mitigating the damage that was done, you know, we asked specifically for biodegradable. Um, there's concern with wildlife ensnarement with 
those types of plastic nettings, even with mulch on them and heavy rains, that mulch gets washed away. We don't know how well they're going to maintain it. Um, I would like to see it all removed. I would like to see all, any non-biodegradable matting removed. And I would like to see the back stabilized. And I don't know if, I believe they were supposed to use a, you know, a, a, a wetland mix, was it, that was supposed to be used there? Um, the general, the general kind of industry consensus for a notice of termination for a project or a certificate of compliance is 70% vegetative cover. Mm -hmm. I don't see 70% on that slope. I would like to see at least 70% vegetative cover before they remove any of their sediment controls, the silt fence and the straw wattle. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to see the non-biodegradable blanket in the front removed. They can remove it and they can put the mulch down. That's If they've got it covered in mulch, I think you know, roughly uh, a roughly uniform layer of three inches of wood mulch suffices for stabilization in the front. Thanks, Jason. I just want to follow up on the 70% of, for the 100 foot buffer. So it's like a forested slope. And when you say 70%, are you talking canopy? Or are you talking ground cover? Because 70% ground cover might not be realistic for the, like the canopy, the tree canopy. Yeah. Sorry, 70% of background of, of pre-project existing background. So okay. not, not canopy per se, but what was there, right? Okay. What did they what did they remove or what did they, you know, damage to the point of, of, of needing to mitigate? Yep. And there was a previous permit on that particular area for the removal of some trees, which I think that was like two years ago at this point. <clears throat> um so we have I could probably sort of a, track down the pictures from yeah, that we do site visit. Some, yeah. Okay. Bruce, go ahead, please. You're muted. I'm just reminding all of us that the stream at the bottom of the slope is not on his property. That the property line is, I don't know, a few feet towards the slope from the stream. So I don't know what happened with all the sediment that ended up going down the slope and into the, the, the other property and the stream. I don't know what happened with that. But that was it. With the first time I went out there with, Mich uh, with uh, Aaron, that was an issue. Yeah. yeah. So since the time that Bruce and I went out, which I believe was the f one of the first site visits, yes. um, they did clean up that material by hand that was okay. property Good. yeah and i did okay. confirm that there there was one site visit i went out and it was partially cleaned up and then i went back and it was it was right. cleaned up so it's yeah it's it's looking much better all around okay thanks bruce andre i support uh jason's ideas um on what to do um i'm ambivalent about the uh that that uh front portion of the uh of the of netting i would like it to be uh biodegradable um but i kind of feel like it's outside of outside of the uh, uh the limits that we uh, that we enforce uh, although there are we can condition things I do also uh, would like to see um, the limit of their uh, of the lawn, et cetera. Um, I, I don't want the uh, hundred foot buffer to go uh, onto their lawn, so I would like them to put their the to put everything behind the one hundred foot buffer. Um, and from the videos, it looked like there's some uh, some overlap. There is, and um, just to clarify, there's like a concrete electrical something um, for their lawn light. So that's in the buffer. So it's a little more than just lawn. There is actually some structure development. Jason? Uh, two things. One, that, that lawn light in the buffer, was that part of the original plan? 
they weren't supposed to be anywhere near the hundred foot buffer with the work. So how did they get, so what, you know, we, we've talked a lot about them doing querying that they weren't supposed to do and everything, but I don't think that I realized that was in the buffer. So they ran an electrical conduit, they poured concrete in the buffer. They presumably augured out a hole to put the concrete in. Is this something that, I mean, what, I guess I'm asking what, uh, is there additional mitigation then that we can require for this? Is this something, where do we go when something yeah. like this happens? I mean, I think they should, they should pull it out. Um, they should pull out that material. They should pull out that structure um, and they should stabilize the area where that structure is located. I also think it would be a really good idea to put in some kind of permanent visual demarcation, which clearly um, identifies where the boundary is located so there's no further encroachment in that area because there was no permitted encroachment into that location um, by the commission. Yeah, I would like to see that pulled out as well. And so um, as far as a permanent demarcation, are we taught, can we require something like a split rail fence? I know we've done rocks, you know, big boulders on, on other projects, but I would also like to see that because, um, you know, like you said, they weren't supposed to be anywhere near the buffer. And then for a point of clarification, uh, I want to make sure, Andre, in the front, I don't care if they replace the erosion control matting, as long as they just remove the non-biodegradable matting and they can put the mulch right back down. Um, they don't need to put an additional biodegradable matting under the mulch. The mulch, for me, the mulch is sufficient as a form of stabilization. But what I don't want is for that mulch to get washed away and there to be just net there. Thanks, Jason. Alex? You're muted. With regard to the 100 foot buffer line, um, just a little bit of background on the suggestion. I'll make the suggestion first. I like the idea of a split row fence with some rocks behind the posts. Um, the split row fence would be visually pleasing and the rocks behind it would remind people where the boundary is when someday somebody rips out that fence. Um, and to answer Jason's question, he thought that he was outside the buffer the way he measured it because he ran a tape from the stream up the slope and he didn't realize that he needed to be 100 feet horizontal from the stream so um, that concrete is sitting it's already poured and it was poured into a pipe so the, the conduit comes out of the ground through a pvc pipe you know into uh, a vertical uh, um, PVC pipe, and then there's there's a pipe, there's pipes within the pipe, and then they poured concrete in it to hold it in place. So that would have to be gotten out of there and moved. That would that would make a mess. Um, if they could leave the lights and not make a mess, I don't. The, the, the damage is already done. No more damage will be done. But he may object to the lights shining through the fence. Um, I wouldn't mind seeing the lights moved outside the buffer, but I don't think I, I would rather see the buffer clearly marked with something that's aesthetically pleasing with something behind the fence to be permanent. Thanks, Alex. I just want to chime in that, well, I like the idea of the boulders behind the fence because I agree that the fence is impermanent. It's pretty sloped, and I think that it would be difficult to place the boulders without some earth moving um just in my memory in the videos um and so there's uh, plenty, of, plenty of flat ground from where the 100 foot buffer is to the beginning of the slope we should maybe revisit the video um jason go ahead yeah there's a um 
for for the the comment that Alex made that he measured, he didn't know how it was supposed to be measured. Um, with the NOIs and with with project plans, that would have been clearly demarcated, correct? Yeah. And are we saying he, the homeowner, or a contractor, or who? Either. How did this get so messed up? Well, they didn't have an NOI, right? They just, this is a they violation. Had a they had a request for determination for <clears throat> some selective tree removal um, at the top of the slope. And the work where the house was and the grading plan that was reviewed by the commission showed work over 150 feet from the resource area. When they got in there, I think what the design concept showed for the that was reviewed by the commission and and approved by the town when they got in there to do the work i think the plan just simply wasn't followed i mean I, I can't speak to like the position of the house and the driveway and that type of thing but relative to the grading and the tree clearing and the site work the the plan was not followed um but there was a plan that clearly showed, right? That showed. Yes. So yes. I guess what I'm what I'm essentially trying to figure out is how did this go that wrong? And yeah, you know, a homeowner, <laughs> the homeowner, in my opinion, yeah. the homeowner is not the one to be out there setting stakes and measuring. Like that would be yeah. a survey crew, and if they're going to be doing grading on a lot, like all that happens by contractors and with surveyors, and the surveyors should have known exactly where if they were if they were demarcating it they would have known exactly where the limit of work is they would have known where the 150 feet or the 100 foot buffer is and i would think that they would have had to mark that so and i know this is somewhat retroactive and and can't necessarily be answered but for future projects i want to just make sure that we like that this doesn't happen again so this would have all been clearly demarcated and it sounds like somebody just went wild. Yeah. And kind of did whatever they wanted to do. Yeah, I think I completely agree with what you're saying, Jason. And what what I understand about the situation is that it was partially um, the homeowner, in addition to being the homeowner, also has access to equipment and um you know, earth moving and, and so forth. So I think it was, it was a sort of a whole semi, semi done themselves and semi done by an outside contractor. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's plenty of blame to go around. Um, one thing that does occur to me, and this is just a suggestion that might sort of bridge the gap, particularly because they just put down all this turf and stabilized this area. I do like the concept of the fencing. Um, I think that the, the boulders would be challenging to get a vehicle back there now that they've done all that placement. So this is just an idea, but on some sites we've required like a permanent fabricated sign um, or multiple signs to be placed that stay something like wetland area, no disturb zone or something um, to be placed like, you know, say 15 to 20 feet apart at that hundred foot buffer facing the property, um, that might be a solution that's a little more permanent because if it's a metal sign that's fabricated, it's going to last a long time. Are you suggesting staked signs? <laughs> I'm sorry, but I feel like there might be some pushback with the aesthetic of that given um, the work in the backyard. I mean, I'm not opposed to it. I'm just, and maybe we should have options. Um, I just want to chime in. So Whatever we do in terms of mitigation, aside from what's been stated, I think that there could be some understory shrubs added back to that that forested slope that would be beneficial for erosion control and just kind of restoring it to a natural condition because it you know got wiped down with silt and it's been dug and it's been cut and it's it's pretty raised. So some interspersed you know shade tolerant vaccinium or something like that it would you know go a great way to restoring that. Um, and Aaron, I mean, I think sometimes have you suggested that we do an NOI for something like this so that we can 
we can condition it and we it is attached to the deed and this can go through a more formal process. Is that an avenue that we can take? Because we have a lot of ideas and I think we talked about that earlier in this um, this issue, um, but I would be in favor of having them do that to sort of right some wrongs here. And under those circumstances, maybe having the conduit within the 100 foot is something that we would have allowed if it had come to us in a formal setting, we probably wouldn't have said no, but it's coming to us in this setting of a violation, which is less palatable. Um, but I just want to put that context out there. Um, I think on Alex was next. Yeah. Um, am I muted? No. Um, Michelle brought up one of the points I wanted to bring up. And from my first trip out there, Aaron talked to me about having him come in with an after the fact permit application, uh, NOI. <clears throat> and then we would have an opportunity to review it and comment on it and condition it. So it's been my expectation that that's where we were headed and rather than an informal uh, discussion and informal closing of the of the deal. So I I would favor what Aaron's always talked about is having him come in formally with a with a plan that would that would neaten everything up and be part of the record. And also, um, although I think a skid steer could easily get rocks in there um, without marring up his backyard. You could also take something like a USGS marker and pound it into the ground so it's flush with the ground, just saying this is where the 100-foot line is and have them every six feet apart. That would not be visually obstructive. It would be permanent. And nobody, no future owner, I don't think, is going to purposely take them out. Um, so there's, I think there's lots of ways to permanently mark the boundary and then visually Something like a split rail fence, I think, would be lovely. And then I like the idea of some shrubs. of so vaccinium have no density, and they really don't produce much wildlife value. So I would rather see um, something other than blueberries. Well, I mean, they're suitable to that slope. But I think a site visit could just, you know, give us some indication of what's already growing there, which is, you know, good for whatever the, the tree cover is. Yeah. Um, I like those USGS um, monuments, but this is like under a tree canopy. And so if we're saying no work after the 100 foot, I'm just worried that it'll be covered and invisible very quickly with leaves or duff or something. So um, something probably more visible would be better yeah. for longevity. Andre? Well, uh, Michelle, you uh, you kind of took the words out of my mouth uh, earlier. Um, look, I'm a proponent of uh, removing everything uh, from the 100 foot buffer, especially given the fact that uh, this was all done um, illegally. But um, Taking into account uh, what Alex was saying about the permanence of the uh, of that uh, light lighting structure that's there, um, and how difficult it would be to replace it, and and especially without uh, causing further damage, uh, the idea of then accepting that and uh, uh, mitigating. Um, by putting uh, shrubs and uh, other vegetation that would help to both fasten the slope and uh, uh, feed some, uh, provide for some wildlife uh, habitat for uh, back there that's been raised, um, I would be, uh, I'd be willing to uh, make that trade. So thanks for uh, bringing those ideas. I, I, I was literally <laughs> writing it down too. So good stuff. And Alex as well. Thank you. Thanks, Andre. Bruce? I agree with Alex, so we should have an NOI. Rachel? The same. I had a question. When does the RDA expire? And then um, in I agree something permanent would be helpful, but would um, offer that each of these options does may carry um, considerable expense. And, and um, maybe we leave it to the NOI applicant to determine 
what permanent solutions they would um, would recommend. For example, um, two days of moving boulders around can be as much as twenty thousand dollars with a grappler and excavator. Um, so again, something permanent. Agree, um, but just what that is, maybe um, maybe there's some flexibility there for review. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, I agree. I mean, split rail fence has a look, so it, maybe we can give options and just discuss what would be um, agreeable to all parties. Alex? Just for clarification, there isn't just one lighting structure. I think there's five or six. There could be more. So moving them is a, is a construction project that's messy. Just, just thought I'd clear that up. Jason? I just want to say I'm in favor of an NOI as well. Okay, so it sounds like we have general consensus that we'd like to move forward with an NOI and a formal filing for this, which, um, again, I think that's was discussed many months ago when we first approached this project. So I don't think we need to vote on that, but Aaron, you will contact. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then I, I'm going to reach out to the landowner and I, I'm actually just going to suggest that they watch the video to hear the commission's discussion. I have notes. Um, I can give them sort of a bulleted list of things that the commission would like to see on the NOI application. But, um, but yeah, I think um, it would be relatively simple and straightforward for them to to come up with some of this stuff. And as Rachel suggested, you know, maybe there's some flexibility for them to make a decision um, with regard to something that's, you know, permanent, but also sort of meets their aesthetic. Um, so I will convey all of this information to the landowner and um, take the next step um, to encourage them or require them to do this. Do we, I guess the, the one question is, timeline, um, giving them time to be able to assemble this and, and get their thoughts together. I mean, um, 45 to 60 days, does that seem reasonable to everybody to give them some time to come back with a, an application? That's okay with me, Jason. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, know I just said that I was in favor of an NOI. Um, Rachel brought up the potential cost for moving boulders. Um, I don't know what it typically costs for an NOI, but I have to assume that that has potentially a significant cost to it as well. So I want to make sure that I fully understand the purpose of asking them to file an NOI. And is that so that we can somehow condition it in a different way and tie things to like, like we're asking for the hundred foot buffer to be permanently marked. Is that something that would be effectively attached to like the deed of the home then like in perpetuity or yes. And can that yeah. be done without the NOI? And, mm -hmm. you know, at this point I would rather if, if we are, if we are taking their, if we are taking resource, like monetary resources into consideration for things, I would rather those resources go towards mitigation and somehow demarcating a permanent boundary than to filing an NOI if we can um, achieve the same results through conditioning or through an enforcement action in some way. So at the same point, in, yeah. In enforcement orders are one of the more flexible documents under the Wetland Protection Act. The commission has a tremendous amount of power and authority, and it also gives the applicant quite a bit of flexibility in terms of implementation of what the commission is asking for. So I think there are, um, there, there are multiple ways to go about achieving the goal, the end goal of what you're looking for here, which is shrub planting a permanent demarcation of the boundary, um, you know, and, and there were, you know, other things that were discussed here, but just to sort of generalize, right, like getting those things accomplished, I think we could do it by, by revising the enforcement order and or by requiring a notice of intent application. I think both could achieve the goal. 
as Jason alluded to, if you if you have an order of conditions, the order of conditions is recorded on the deed, and then they have to get a certificate of compliance once the work is done to clear it or to to um, resolve it so it's no longer there. Um, but you can also record require an enforcement order to be required um, and and lifted later as well. So. Um, just making sure that that's clear that you guys have authority to do one or the other or both. So Aaron, in your experience then, do you have an opinion or like a pro con balance here? Yeah. I mean, so this is my thought on it. I agree that this was an egregious violation. I agree that they went way beyond what they should have done, but I do think that this landowner did go to I think they went, they, they did try to comply. And, and I went back once a week for a month and a half. And every time I went, they were implementing more and more measures. They were taking steps to do what we were asking them to do. And so I really appreciate that. And they've been really great to work with, very cooperative. So for that reason, I think, and also because I know they spent a lot of money to try to do this right, um, as the commission asked them to, I think, I think it would be, reasonable um, to say, we want you to come up with a planting plan. We want you to come up with a concept for a permanent um, demarcation of that 100 foot buffer zone um, and, you know, potentially address some of these other questions that the commission's asked for. Come to the commission and present those things and implement them. I don't necessarily think they would need to file an NOI, but if the commission felt strongly they wanted that, then I would understand why. So. I think it could go either way, um, but those are my thoughts. Bruce, go ahead. So how much does the NOI cost? I mean, it could be highly variable depending on the project, right? Yeah, and it really depends, I think, a lot on sort of the um, knowledge and skill of the homeowner um, to, to take it on. So like just the filing process, um, the notification of abutters and the legal ad, I would estimate to be in the ballpark of just under a thousand dollars um to do, to do that filing process um so yeah i mean that's a minimum of what they're looking at probably to file an noi and and that doesn't include development of a plan or you know some permanent um you know that would be the record of the order of conditions of what they're proposing to do alex so maybe Aaron could give them a choice and say the commission uh, could ask you to file an NOI or uh, perhaps you could come up with a plan that would um, that, that the commission could entertain, both of which would cut to the same thing. And here's what they're looking for, blah, 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 A, B, C, D. And let, they'll figure it out. And I suspect what they'll do is decide to not file an NOI, but to come hire a consultant to put together a plan <clears throat> that we could look at. We'd wind up at the same spot, but they would know that we could require an NOI. And, uh, and then if Aaron is correct, that on an enforcement order, whatever the final is, we could attach it to the deed. And um, it I think we want to have something attached to the deed. For example, just going back to the USGS things in the ground, the deed would say there are USGS markers for the 100 foot buffer at these coordinates, and there's 10 of them. And so if they get buried, somebody can go out there with a magnet and find them. But Aaron's good at talking to people. And every time I've been there, they have been more than cooperative. Um, and I agree with Aaron that. I don't, there's no need to spend more money than has to be to get to the end product that we want. And it's more, I care less about the process than I do the product and the fact that it's recorded. Yeah. So to clarify, Aaron, it could be recorded, the enforcement order and conditions could be. Yeah. Convinced. And I need to get some clarity on this as well um, for recording purposes. So I'll find out legally speaking like for recording because we need to find out for Fort River School as well on the minor amendment like how to get those um, elements of the um, uh, operation and maintenance plan um, in there too so I, I'll find out on both these issues in one um, to get an answer and so I know exactly how we're going to address it. 
Um, Bruce. Bruce. Who was? Andre. Andre. I'll be real quick. I'm not a proponent of the NOI. Okay. If we can do, uh, uh, achieve things uh, otherwise. Bruce. I just wanted to thank Jason for um, not letting us go down the wrong path. Or a path that was difficult, knowing it didn't need to be. Rachel. I wonder if, it, if there's a third option in the menu of options. Would a second RDA be a possibility um, if they didn't want to have an enforcement order recorded to their deed? Could we record? That might be a questionnaire. And could we have them record the RDA for the the completed yeah. I mean, I think what I'd like to do is get an answer on get get a legal answer before speaking with the landowner of what sort of the options are for getting something recorded that is meaningful in terms of making sure that boundary and any plantings are protected into the future um, relative to, you know, the commission's actions and requirements. Um, and then let that sort of guide what the process will be. Um, and then, you know, explain to the landowner sort of what the commission is asking for and to start thinking about putting a plan together and what these these things would um, look like in terms of, you know, boundary demarcation, plantings, et cetera. Let them start thinking about that. Um, and then maybe at the next meeting, I can report back to you um, while the you know, wheels are turning for the owner and we can come to consensus on what sort of the end um, result might be for getting it permanently um, memorialized. Thanks, Aaron. I mean, if the enforcement order can be recorded, I'd be in support of that. The one thing that we would lose is the butter notification, which just because the butters have been impacted almost on every side of this property, um, I thought there might be some benefit to that, but go ahead, Jason. Um, yeah, just for Aaron, you mentioned wanting to potentially get the homeowner's wheels moving as far as the delineation and things. We can give them our suggestions, correct? Like you, I assume that that will be part of the conversation is that, you know, the commission we've thrown out ideas such as X, Y, Z. Yeah. You know, I don't, ex I personally, I don't expect them to necessarily go out and hire a consultant to come up with a planting plan for that slope. Mm -hmm. And then I, agree. I don't think we should record, assume, yeah. I'd like to yeah. see a split rail fence with those, with those GIS markers or GPS mark, um, whatever. I mean, yeah. I yeah. think that's an easy way. And if that can be, and if, if that can be reported to the deed that that's the hundred foot buffer, then I assume once it gets sold, that'll be in the information when they have to go and survey the lot. Okay. Um, I'm a real no on the G, P, the markers, the ground markers. Like having been to that site, it's just going to get covered in needles in one season. So maybe tree markers, like just something. Not, sorry, but, sorry. Not GPS markers alone. No, I mean the the like ground mounted yeah. medallions. They, they, Those work on rocks. They don't work in the middle of the forest. They have ones that stand up from the ground that have okay. a um sure, like, like a medallion on Dickinson. the top. Yeah. As um, long yeah, as it Yeah. But they have ones okay. that are much more um prominent. They they have them in the Amherst Hills subdivision. Um they they say wetland boundary marker and they it looks like a piece of rebar with a, a marker okay. like a like a USGS marker. Low profile top. but visible. Yes. So sounds yep. good. Okay. Yep. All right. So just to sum and wrap this up, um Erin has our suggestions and you are going to find out about how the enforcement order could be recorded and conditioned and you're going to discuss the possibilities of the NOI and enforcement order with the homeowners and our suggestions and get a read on them for what they want to do going forward and then we'll hear about it next meeting is that yeah I'm going to tell them what end result you're looking for and these are some avenues and I'm also going to get a legal read on what what options there are for recording um or you know getting it memorialized and i'll come back at the next meeting with some updates okay thank you all right um 
Thanks everyone, that was important and hopefully it will inform us for future similar discussions of which I hope we have none. <laughs> but anyway, good talk. Um, all right, <laughs> monitoring reports. <laughs> Uh, I, I just good good things to report, which are that a lot of the issues that have I've been seeing on sites have been getting resolved. Um, so it's it's been laborious but worthwhile <laughs> to be on people to correct things. So uh, things that seem to be better now than they were early spring when uh, everything was a mess. So it's feeling like things are a little bit. Okay. Tightening up I'll, a little bit. I'll on take sites. the good news. Great. For um, now, <laughs> I think I've gotten to everything except public comment. Yeah, except public comment. So, I see one attendee. Please raise your hand if you have any comments. I see none. Okay. All right. Nice work, guys. I move we adjourn. Second. Alex on the motion. Jason on second. Rachel. Aye. Jason. Aye. Andre. Aye. Alex. Aye. Bruce. Aye. And I'm an aye. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you next if, time. Uh, if some of you can, if you guys can hold on just for a second, I had a question. Uh, yeah. Or... Aaron has to hold on. Sorry, Aaron. Oh, okay. All right. uh, just a quick, uh, uh, I found a whole bunch of uh, beech trees um, around my, around uh, Bay Road and going up uh, up the hill toward uh, 